I'm Yanis Ayas. I'm your host this afternoon. I take over from, uh, from Kirsi. I'm the deputy head of units from the organizing unit, Valorization Policies and IPR. And um, I think that also we're going to have a very interesting afternoon sessions with uh, us, the ones in the morning. So without further delaying, I would like to um, introduce you to the first session of the afternoon, which is called Finding Inspiration by Enhancing Collaboration and Networking. And um, I will give the floor to Thomas Flanagan, which is the moderator of that, of that session. He's a director at Enterprise and Commercialization at Nova U UCD University College Dublin. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. That's great. Great to see you all this afternoon and, uh, and welcome to this session. So inspiring, ins or inspiring uh, collaboration and networking. Uh, ASCP used to have a great button that they put on badges, which was, if you're not networking, you're not working. <laughs> and it's very true, but it's great to see the, the collaboration and the networking that we see um, when you're all out having lunch and, uh, and connecting. Um, I had a chance on the way over to have a look at the code of practice, and I think the code of practice is, it's taken a lot of work, and it's a very powerful baseline for what we do. But it is missing the inspirational part, the people that make it happen. And I'm delighted to have on the panel here today young people who have that inspiration and that drive and ambition to make it happen. And uh, one of the things that I always say to my team about being in the knowledge transfer space is that these jobs are fun jobs. They really are fun jobs. And if you're not having fun, you're probably not doing the job right. So it is about connecting with people. It is about getting out there and making things happen. But it's great to have the code of practice as a baseline. But what hopefully we'll do this afternoon is give you a sense of the kind of fun that can be had in knowledge transfer, in particularly in the networking and in the collaboration that, that goes on. So I'll ask each, uh, I suppose, in terms of my own background, uh, just to say that I had a perfectly good career before I got into knowledge transfer when I worked in the US in a major multinational and started out as an engineer, but, but uh, became vice president for sales and marketing. Uh, I transferred back to, to Europe here and um, set up the first tech transfer office in one university, built that up over time uh, and built a consortium around it as well and supported other universities in the space. And then in the last uh, six years, I've moved to a larger university where I run the, uh, the the knowledge transfer office, the consultancy, the incubation, uh, and that, that unit has just celebrated 20 years in operation. Uh, we've supported over 550 companies. Those companies have gone out and raised 1.3 billion euro uh, of investment. Uh, and we even have our own unicorn. So we have a unicorn, the company's called Wayflyer, worth 1.6 billion. So it's great to have that within the portfolio because it really does inspire everybody else to do a little better. And uh, that's what it's all about. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll let Helena introduce herself. Hi. Uh, for, the past, for the last couple of years, I've been uh, working as a technology, trans technology uh, information officer in the technology transfer office at Enterprise Estonia. Uh, our team mainly helps small and medium-sized companies uh, with intellectual property questions. That includes uh, intellectual property strategy, and uh, we strongly promote uh, non-registered uh, types of intellectual property too, so uh, trade secrets and, uh, and such. So our goal is if you can keep it secret, keep it secret. Uh, but we also work uh, with uh, finding uh, R&D partners for, uh, for those small and medium-sized companies so that they could develop and they would develop. Um, from my background, I have a master's degree in science and uh, uh, I finished my uh, uh, career in a private company as an engineer. I didn't uh, continue to the leading positions. So I have been an engineer in a private company. Uh, my job was to integrate and combine uh, different uh, automation systems uh, and that included uh, some work with uh, different academic uh, institutions uh, to get the uh, most suitable solutions. So I've seen both sides of that table. Very good, thanks. Thanks very much, Helena. 
How many other countries here have somebody like Helena, have an organization that does what she does in terms of doing the patent work, checking that uh, for, for SMEs, for small companies, checking whether or not there are patents out there that they could use or giving them the freedom to operate? How many? Raise hands. Organizations like that? Yeah, you guys have? And you are? Sweden. Sweden. Excellent. It's not about Correct, yeah, we know. We'll, we'll, all, we'll all agree to that. Okay, thanks very much. Javier. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Javier Uranga from, from Spain. Uh, I am an uh, innovation consultant, uh, although my, as most of the, my, the engineers, as I am a biomedical engineer, um, I have ended in the consulting world. Um, in Zavala, what uh, we are do, are, which are our main objective, is to support uh, any type of entities with their with their innovation. No? So we define their uh, innovation strategy, and then we try to find the public funding, mostly public, more than private, in order to implement that strategy. No? So uh, well, we have offices in Spain, but also abroad. You have seen here my colleagues from from, from Brussels. And um, I'm European, so I'm in charge more of the European brand uh, branch of the business now, and we uh, also participate in uh, European projects, no? uh, carrying out the uh, dissemination, communication, and exploitation uh, activities. I, mean, I am leading the exploitation team, and what we do here is to support mainly academia, although we also work with public administration and industry, but the ones that are having more troubles in order to valorizing their results in European projects, mostly are uh, the academia. So uh, we work with them uh, during the project, since the beginning of the project, to try to get the most value uh, of, the, of them. No? And we have been participating in many projects, but uh, just for these exploitation activities in more than 20 European projects. And I'm happy here to share uh, our experience uh, in those projects. So hopefully it could enlighten no, or make all others to follow. Thank you. Very good, Javi, and you're too modest. Uh, this company, there's 500 people in the company, consultants that have been in business for the last 20 years, and um, they, their business is EU, uh, developing EU projects, winning EU projects. They have a 40% hit rate on winning projects. One's worth knowing. Over to you, Sophia. Hello, good afternoon. Um, well, I'm Sofia. I'm coming from the University of Algarve. Perhaps you already have heard about the Algarve, but um, I'm part of a team that wants to change uh, the approach that the Algarve, this uh, touristic region in the south of Portugal, wants to present uh, to Europe and also to the world. So I'm part uh, of CRIA, CRIA is the Division of uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of uh, Algarve. And I'm the responsible for managing the intellectual property rights within the university. Uh, also, uh, we are responsible to uh, manage the park, the scientific and technological park uh, of the Algarve that is going, that is actually starting to um, its activity, it started its activity last year. And uh, we are now uh, having uh, um, some of the uh, preeminent uh, companies uh, uh, in acceleration process within uh, the campus of the university. So basically, this is my what I'm doing right now. Thanks very much, Sophia. Thank you. Yes, my name is Juan. I am also from well, Spain, same as Javier. And uh, my background is from technology and also from communication. I'm an expert in that field. I studied in UC Berkeley in the States and then developed my professional career in Europe. My company, the Tech Valley, is uh, specialized in helping organizations to create environments for networking and making the best of value of their discoveries and also the, their strategies. And at the same time, we experiment with all kind of um, technologies, applying those technologies to live websites like magazines and see how that technologies react and we use that uh, examples and the proof cases to 
feed up uh, our advice to our clients. We have a website, a magazine, online magazine that is fintechnews.org, or ORG, and uh, that's created by us, and it has more than 10 million viewers per year. It's about fintech, but also was an experiment. Uh, it's also six years in the market, and the, we run that company as well. Thank you. Very good, thank you very much, Juan. That's fantastic. That's a very interesting uh, company in terms of social media and doing it at a very professional level probably way more professional than most of us do. Um, and, and it's very interesting to see that. Let's start with Sophia and tell us about setting up offices, setting up a new office and going from there, beginning to do tech transfer. Yeah. It's an extremely challenging question, uh, Tom. So um, setting a, an office. We, if I can uh, um, share a little bit of the experience that we had in, in the University of Algarve, I can start telling you that uh, in the first moment we identified clearly, it was clearly identified that uh, we had very interesting uh, research results, but um, something was lacking. And at this moment, we are talking about 20 years ago, uh, it was defined by the, the, the national government, an opportunity to start increasing the value of uh, at that moment, uh, only about uh, industrial property rights. So the government established and defined the possibilities for universities, technology parks, uh, uh, technology centers that would uh, engage universities and, uh, and companies um, to participate in a program that was supported by the National Institute for Industrial Property. And at that, at that moment, it was um, the moment to start um, creating awareness in terms of uh, the, the, the universities and giving the knowledge for uh, the industrial property rights. So what's a patent, what's a trademark, uh, how can this uh, be important? Is this uh, important at all? So uh, in a moment that the university was not concerned that, it, that had at that moment uh, zero um, concerns or zero preoccupation in terms of protecting their assets, the universities in Portugal started to be engaged in the first moment in order to, okay, we need to define a strategy and we need to maybe start creating um, ways that we will um, perhaps uh, have uh, the opportunity to commercialize and val valorize our, um, our technologies, our results. So introducing the industrial property rights in the terms of promoting those, uh, those rights and creating that awareness. The universities were able to, in that moment, uh, understand why do we exist in industrial property rights? What's the difference between industrial property rights or the concept of intellectual property rights? So it was uh, a moment that the university started to, um, to be engaged on that, but with the support of, um, of national entities. In a second moment, also with the support of uh, national entities and the government, it was created a network called UTEN, University Technology Enterprise Network. That network had, it was kind of second phase for the, the, um, the valorization of knowledge. And in that moment, the, um, it was possible to establish different partnerships with different entities in the uh, overseas, in the United States, with MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, um, Ute Austin, uh, in, in here, Fraunhofer Institute, uh, and also with Cambridge, Cambridge Enterprise. And at that moment, uh, again, all the Portuguese universities, the public Portuguese universities, had the possibility to um, have on board knowledge, not only in a national level, but also in an international level, in order to increase the value of our results, in order to promote and uh, in order to receive knowledge that would allow us to get into the next level when, if we have a, a, a research result in terms of uh, transferring that result, in terms of commercializing that research result. So basically those were very two, two important moments because they also give, in the first moment, they give finance, the finance opportunity for the universities in order to, to set up uh, these kinds of, um, of small office to promote industrial property rights. In the second level, it was a, a partnership uh, based in training. And that's a point that it's extremely essential for the existence and also for the surviving of a technology transfer office. Having training, having staff that is capable of helping the researchers in order <coughs> to, um, uh, if they are engaged and if they are willing to, to, to valorize their knowledge, 
that is, uh, it is very important to have this capacity of having uh, training and receive training from entities such as ASCP, the EPO, uh, Autumn, entities that uh, are really um, interested in, and that are really committed on these goals. And also um, being able to participate in these networks is extremely uh, relevant, specifically because uh, like this, we are not only having the opportunity to understand our national ecosystem, but also uh, if we want to license our technology to international partners, here we are having the doors open uh, in terms of uh, sharing knowledge and understanding, starting to understand better what others do and how they do it in terms in a, in in an international level when you want to licensing or when you want to go international with your spin-off or spin-off spin company. So basically these notes I think is essential. So do you have to travel to set up a tech transfer office? Like you reached out to the US and uh, various places across Europe. How much engagement did you need to do to get the first license or to get the first spin out? Well, so, so um, this is, it is important because in the first moment we need to understand how things happen. And we need to also to give some kind of confidence to our researchers and of course, we, if we want to do things, it's good if we start learning and if we start learning with uh, entities that uh, know better how to do it. So I I for us it was important, it was really the, the the, the, key, the key moment because we understood that for a region such as the Algarve and for a university such as the University of Algarve, we could not pick up the phone and phone to a huge company and say, hi, I'm from the University of Algarve and I have here ter tremendous technologies. Would you like to look at it? Of course, no one would like, no one would speak with uh, Sophia from the University of Algarve. But if we are having the proper uh, connections, if we are uh, getting if we are part of some kinds of networks, if we are engaging with our uh, national and international partners, we are getting collaboration closer and we are opening sometimes doors that we don't know that they were existing even. So for us it was important because in the first moment we understand, okay, perhaps for our region, um, we will be more dedicated to create spin-offs. We will be more dedicated to create awareness in terms of developing uh, new companies. Perhaps it will be uh, uh, um, uh, the goal of this region. And then we decided, okay, if we are going to have intellectual property or if we are going to have research results, we will try to identify very closely uh, the strategy for each of these uh, intellectual property rights. We only have an international patent when we have uh, the possibility to go to international, if we have finance uh, possibilities to go international. Otherwise, we are not moving forward for an international patent. But um, because of international uh, approaches and collaborations, it was also important uh, to uh, operate some uh, legislative changes. And for, for instance, in Portugal, uh, we adopted the provisional patent applications. It was quite useful because it was based uh, on uh, international experience, as you all know, and uh, based in the, the, um, the provisional patent application of the, the United States. So it was a very important moment also for the units for industrial property promotion in Portugal. And it was also uh, part of this uh, result that uh, was uh, um, used uh, because of this network that was established in 2008. Uh, feel free to ask questions, just raise your hands. Somebody has a microphone, they will be to you in moments. I don't know where they are. Could you, who's, who's got the mic? Oh, you have. If you do have questions, jump in anytime. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit, because you're seeing all the different universities, have you? So uh, tell us about, in terms of what you see in the, the various funding schemes that are out there to support tech transfer. Okay, so... I will mainly focus on European grants now, although they are already in, in of course, in their different uh, countries and even um, at regional level, there should be some, um, not for setting up the tech tra transfer office, but to make it running. And usually what we have been, you know, with all the universities um, that we are working, especially in Spain, the tech transfer office is um, already integrated in the organizational structure of the of the university or of the research organization, and so mainly is covered by projects, by uh, collaborative projects with industry, 
or um, with other uh, research organizations. No, uh, all any project that is being funded in most uh, public funding, there is this uh, overheads or flat rate in which um, they uh, well, uh, could be used. No, to uh, to cover all this all these structure costs. In my case, for example, before being a, a consultant, I was also a researcher. And how I started and how I entered the, re the research environment was also through a collaboration between a research organization and an industry because this technology transfer office, uh, he was moving, like looking for industries uh, that wanted to invest or to spend you know, in develop new technologies. They make this agreement with uh, this uh, technology transfer I mean, with this technology transfer that was working in a uh, bi biomedical center. So, and they and I started working no, in, as a researcher, and it was a really nice experience. And I think uh, what is true is that not maybe not always these technology transfer offices uh, are aware no, of what is inside their 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 department. No, I, I mean inside their institution, even especially in those very big institutions. And regarding uh, other uh, programs, no European programs that could be used, and at least to develop new strategies or new procedures, no, uh, are I think one of the most, the biggest ones is the European Innovation Ecosystem. No, there there are some topics which are looking for connect uh, enterprises and academia, for example, or the the Widera program as well, in which there are. Um, also, in which the main goal no, is to strengthen the European research area. So there are also topics there to increase the capacity uh, of researchers in, in intellectual property and to defining and how this could be created. No? And in order to do so, it's important to collaborate between um, institutions from different countries and bring together uh, all the knowledge and try to define something that could be use uh, and, and implement uh, in all Europe. No, otherwise, sometimes it's quite uh, dispersed. There are, I have m uh, more more topics, no, not maybe just not related with IP, but also on how to create value from their, from their research, no, or to professionalize, to professionalize the management of, the, uh, of how, of, of how the researchers are, um, yeah, are, are using the, the, the result and as well collaborative in how to, or to facilitate no, the collaboration in, in the writing of uh, and publishing of, uh, of peer review papers no, among institutions from different countries. I think we need to, to make this um, more open. Very good, so next. Yeah, so the Widera programs. How many people are involved in Widera programs have got proposals in, have won proposals? Put your hand up, be proud. Yes, one, two, three. Okay, four. <laughs> okay, so maybe not so many. It's worth looking at, isn't it? The Wideira program is there's uh, there's great funding in there to support the development of this. Helena, let me ask you about in terms of moving people. So uh, for academics to move or for industry people to move back and forth um, across that industry academia divide. Are there opportunities for that? Is that something that you see important? Oh, that is de definitely important. Uh, for example, in Estonia, we have a national grant for uh, researchers to work in industry. The grant is uh, up to 70% of the pay for a researcher that works at least uh, half time uh, in an industry company. So the main goal of it is to show researchers what it's like to work uh, for a company, but also to bring back in the knowledge of uh, industry to the research institution. Uh, for example, um, uh, it ha has been running already since 2014, and uh, uh, in the first six years, uh, 25 projects have re received support. So they range from antibody development to space science, so basically everything is covered. It's, it's is most of the movement from academia to industry, or do you find you can get some industry to move into academia? Mm. Until now, the grant has been for uh, scientists to move to 
uh, industry, so academia at your industry. But uh, since um, either last year or, be or beginning of this year, uh, it is uh, for both sides. So we don't know about uh, the numbers, how many are going to use it uh, to get uh, industry people to academia. That's going to be in the future. But uh, until now, it's been yes, uh, academia at your industry. Good. And what, uh, Sophia, um, anything about co-programs or you're doing things as well? Yes, of course. So at this level, for in terms of personal mobility and um, how my uh, co um, colleague was uh, mentioning, we also have these kinds of PhD PhDs programs that are going that are going to um, uh, that are happening between the university and also between uh, with industry on board. And uh, recently, we uh, we have also um, an interesting program based uh, in our uh, recent uh, accelerator within that established within the university, Walk Tech Campus. And uh, within this accelerator, which is uh, one of the first accelerators with the proper regulation for it, um, it the, the challenge was uh, to the companies that are on the accelerator and also the companies to the re of the region, uh, they are going to define the teams for the PhDs. So here we are asking to industry to uh, present to the university which are the thematic areas that are going to that they would like to see expressed uh, in, a, in a PhD thesis. So this is uh, probably a, a, an interesting approach on the on this uh, team. And also um, we actually do have uh, many co-promotion uh, projects uh, where the university is engaged with a company and uh, the goal will be to uh, develop a, a new research, a re research result that is going to, that has interest for this company to expose. So the, the result of this co-promotion program that starts with the consortium agreement will be at the end of the, usually it's two, three years of this uh, um, uh, co-promotion program to have a license agreement. And Juan, do you, are you involved in this area of meeting people? And people do? Well, actually, um, our expertise is just to amplify the value of the, uh, in, in every, both for networking and for dissemination of the results, even if academia or industry, it's all about value. So um, our approach um, in academic and also industry is just to help identify the value and then try to amplify that value in order to find this, the right stakeholders. For example, um, we got some university research groups that they develop something and they focus because they, the discovery or the patent is towards the food industry. So all the dissemination and the working is focused into the food industry, right? But mostly, most of the time, you don't get the attention of the food industry by approaching them directly. So what we do is we help them to identify the value. There's a lot of value in, in everything that we do. The problem is breaching the gap from the final destination of that value. So in, in a in practical case, if you want to reach the industry, the food industry, you're gonna be more successful by approaching their clients and make the clients talk about your discovery and then you will get the attention in an indirect way that is going to be even more effective than that. But it's also about that and, and moving people around and, and, and let them interact with each other is also more challenging day by day due to digital technology, to AI and all the things that we have. And uh, right now, in this room, we are creating value. And if you want to disseminate that value, you probably post something on LinkedIn, right? So, but you are reaching only your community. But if you disrupt that amplification with some strategies, it could be more effective. It could be more reachable. Our message, our content, our value that we're creating right now could be more approachable for stakeholders that they need our value, but they are not in our circle. Uh, if, uh, just an example, if I, if I post something right now on my LinkedIn or my Facebook, 
uh, my mom that is in Argentina, for sure she will amplify my message, right? But you will be, <laughs> it will be like an informal way of approaching the, the, the digital world. But also that will be gathered within the algorithm of the social media. And then it will be an ampli a valid amplification for them. It will be misleading because they will think that in Argentina they, they're taking care of what we are saying right now. But if in the first level my mom amplifies with a very good reach, then the second level is my cousin, and then the third level is my friend. So if you use that example to approach unconventional networks to promote your value, to promote your research, to promote your results, uh, we are seeing that is much more effective and we are using what it should be against us using in our direction so it's, it's more doable that we can, we can share the value that we can create more easily. I don't know if that responds. That's, well, yeah, no, no, I think you've taken this into an, an interesting area of how do you get above the noise of social media if you have something that's really worthwhile putting out there? How do you do that? And, and you talked about us creating value here. So what would you recommend that we should do if we wanted to make this a one that everybody feels that they're missing? Oh, I, sorry, <laughs> forgot to press the button. <laughs> Go ahead, you heard the question. Maybe just yes. feed back the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. What would, it, we, what would we do with to amplify, to make this event, right? Yeah. More notable? Um, it's a very good question, but I, it's, instead of, may, may, I might not correct you, but just like it's a misconception into the using of the digital world. We, we don't want to be on top, we just want to be really into it, right? The only thing that we have to do is just really the challenging point is identifying the value that we are adding now. If we can extract a summary of what we are discussing, like for example, I don't know, the patenting process, uh, and, and if we drive this, whoever is watching us socially, digitally right now, it's, it's pretty much the same group, except for myself that I'm more like out of the, but pretty much it's the same audience. So we are, we, whatever we do, we, we will get pretty much the same result. So in order for Amplify this with a larger reach, actually it's an invitation to other part of the society to make the most of what we are talking right now. And probably you need to challenge yourself and go to reach hospitals, reach kindergartens, bring teachers, bring unconventional final stakeholders and users into the conversation. And then how do you do that? Just we extract the value that we think that we are adding and involve, identify who can we involve into the reach and the social media. And it's incredibly easy once you identify that to, to do that. And uh, one of the, our practical case that we have is um, one university came out with a discovery in terms of communicating among companies, right? So they are thinking that into the university campuses and they promote that into university campuses and they approach universities, but by chance one of the guys in the university did that with, a, amplified that into the uh, communication agencies forum in, in London, and they got so many calls from the agencies, communication agencies, that doesn't have any to do in their, in their, in their previous target, and they have very successfully f uh, doing that. So the first identifying the value that we are adding, I can have some idea, but, but then approaching other unconventional sectors within the digital world in order to amplify it. That's interesting, isn't it? And so it's not about getting above the noise, it's about going after a different customer segment, kind of the blue ocean strategy. Um, interesting, that's a very interesting point. Any questions from the audience at this stage? Yes, we have a question over here. You just wait for the mic to uh, get there. 
Test. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the presentation. My name is uh, Dorinza Ulnici. I am the head of the Moldovan Office for Science and Technology. And I was curious to know if you have any advice for associate uh, countries in how to we can better collaborate with uh, organizations from the EU member states. And uh, if your organization are involved if, uh, in collaboration with uh, associated and uh, candidate countries. Thank you. Let me just, are you asking about collaboration how do you get into a collaboration for a research project, or how do you get into a collaboration to license something or to create a spin-out? Both, both are oh, okay. feasible, yes. Who'd like to take that? Yeah? I can, I can take it. So um, one of the most important things when you want to collaborate, you need to know with whom no, you want to collaborate with. So uh, what we recommend first is, well, two, first to internally recap of what is your um, best research area, no? or in which one you are providing the highest value. Then, um, if you want to collaborate inside your country, so you, you need to, to see inside your country, so which are those that are participating. But to participate in European projects, what is important is to check who are uh, or the European programs and which are the, those European programs in which this knowledge that you are providing could fit more. And then, uh, try to look um, or try to analyze which are the top entities in, uh, that are leading that technology. And try, because for sure they are going to participate in, in, in a topic for that technology. So you can offer them and your, your work and your collaboration and pro maybe one say no, but if, uh, maybe at the third time you, you start, you are introduced in, in their consortium and you start participating in European projects. And once you start par uh, participating, it's easier to contact because you start to come in here also in Brussels to make more, to a uh, different type of events on your field and you, you make more contacts and it's easier to participate. But, so, but to, in order to start at, and to break no, this barrier is to know uh, what are you, uh, which field no, you, you want to participate and analyze the European programs and then contact, which are those entities. There used to be a website that you could go to and you would find out who's looking for partners. Is that still a, a thing? Do, we, do you want to put that up on the slider there as to that website might be useful for people? It is useful to kind of see what people are looking for. Um, and of course, the usual problem is that the people that contact you are not the people that you would want to contact. That's the challenge. But anybody else got comments on that? in terms of how to do collaborations. You do collaborations. Sorry. So in terms of collaborations, yes, we, we do participate at the university and we have a, a very strong support from the directory, from the rector and the vice rectors on that. So to have the upper management support it is quite important to, to move forward on that, um, at least within the academia. So we do participate in a lot of European projects uh, we prefer the European projects that can uh, um, incentivize the technology transfer or the technology commercialization, although they are not that many, at least for the region, um, for a, a region like, uh, like the one I'm coming for, from, um, because it's not eligible for all the programs. But um, yes, we, we tend to, to use uh, and um, uh, all the, the European opportunities that uh, also the, the universities, the um, um, there are consortiums now for European universities, so uh, our university is also part of that, and it's quite interesting. And um, we do benefit, benefit um, we would try to be part of some of um, interesting networks in terms of promoting the technology transfer. Uh, we are a PATLIB center, so uh, uh, we engage with the EPO. We try to be... Um, always on board in all the activities they are trying to, to do and to disseminate. We also enjoy pretty much all the activities that uh, ASTP uh, mm, develops and we try to be on board too. Uh, and also um, perhaps uh, um, finding more collaborations opportunities can, uh, uh, again, if we, uh, if we do 
participate actively in these kinds of networks, it, usually we find partner, partners uh, whenever we want to do, but, but we have to look and we have to be active on that. Very good. Very good. Thanks, Sophia. Um, we have a question coming in here, and this, this uh, might help us go viral. Is academia, industry, collaboration, and open marriage? I'll go to you, Juan, on that one. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, but I think it's uh, we, academia, university, and, and industry are uh, more in a need of being closer and closer as we progress into this digital area. And um, I think there are, we are meant to understand each other and, and work together. The, the challenges are that um, over the last five years, we've been in, in with the stakeholders that we discuss these, these issues is we are seeing um, that the void, the gap between academia and, and, and industry is a healthy gap because it's, it remains, as long as you promote a space in a collaboration space, a discussion space, it's not uh, once again against each other. It's the way we can collaborate to move into that. And, and we are analyzing the, the, the way that many results from, from academia are getting faster to the industry in recent years is due to the capacity of being not that attached to reality and have a, a, a very perspective from the, from the research point of view. And in that case, the digital area is also helping the academic teams just to get more feedback from the market and also enrich their process to that. So I think it is a, a very good relationship that it will last many years. If it, yeah, jump in on that, yeah. Um, I also want to add that uh, while Juan talked more about the, the relationship between uh, academia and industry than on a pure uh, technical part, uh, it all depends on the contracts. And that's why it's important to protect your own intellectual property and know how licensing works so that uh, the ma marriage wouldn't be too open. <laughs> That's very good. Any other advice on that one from the audience? You have a question, sir. Yeah. Hi, uh, Andreas from the University in Bergen, Norway. I work as an innovation advisor. Uh, Helena said she's seen the world from both sides. So have I. I had sp uh, 12 years in the SME sector. And the world looks extremely different from, from outside and inside the academic bubble. And, and, and the challenge with networking is that um, the people who have only been inside a bubble, they don't have this, uh, let's call it industry literacy. So they don't know why they should network uh, in which ways with whom. So, so they don't have, in a way, the right motivation. And, and, and it's possible to train them one by one, but it takes a lot of time. The obvious solution is to recruit people with industry experience. It doesn't work because there's a big salary gap. Uh, so what we do, how can we systematically sort of train this industry literacy? Great, uh, great uh, question. All right. I, I think personally that the, uh, the knowledge transfer space, it requires a great deal of skill and a great many skills which are kind of unique and you need to have spent a bit of time in industry as well as in academia. And you can start on either side, but you have to have done a bit of both to really understand and be able to bridge that gap. I think that's, that's the challenge. And I don't think any one training program is likely to do that for you. There is a need to actually move between um, industry and academia. Th that'd be my answer to it. Any other answers to that question? Yes. Okay, so for, from my both side view, um, I have worked in two work groups uh, that uh, both collaborated with companies. Um, and the pay gap didn't play that much role there anymore because the contracts that came from industry or the third party financing covered that pay gap. So my recommendation 
uh, actually is that if you can't uh, send acad academics uh, to industry to work, for example, with uh, sectorial mobility grants like Estonia has, then hiring in someone from uh, industry is a really good idea because uh, teaching something like that is really difficult. Thanks, Tom. I'll just be two seconds, but um, Laura McDonald from one of the other panels, for those of you who aren't even. Uh, just, I'm doing a bit of a plug here because I'm really promoting three examples, initiatives right now, which happen to be funded EU projects, which are touching on some of the questions and the topics you talked about. The first one is, there's a brand new project just started called Shuttle, which is all about exchange. It's, it's basically going to fund the exchange from both academia into industry and the other way around. Um, across a defined number of universities. And one of the things is, apart from upskilling and, and, and you know, helping those who directly participate, the program will also try and understand what are the key ingredients for success, or the challenges and successful uh, factors to make such exchange programs work. So that might be a nice, inspiring model. You talked about training and so on. There's another project which is just one third of its way through, which is actually looking at identifying the soft skills. There's been a lot of conversation this morning, or this afternoon, sorry, about networking and communication. So there's a really interesting analysis that's been taking place, um, and the initial report just came out about a month ago, which is about soft skills for knowledge transfer, not necessarily for individuals, but for the process of innovation, innovation management. So I would encourage, um, we can share information about where that sits, but basically that might be a really interesting um, way to look at developing different ways to uh, share understanding and combining knowledge and there will be some new um, tools developed in that project as well so again very useful hopefully not just for uh, academia but also for industry and SMEs so I think these are, are two kind of key projects and the very final one to our friends in Mo Moldova I would really applaud a project which is just about to finish called Fit for NMP which was specifically about identifying talented newcomers so research centres and companies with no track record of collaborating in Europe um, to identify them in a specific sector, so manufacturing technology, for example, and then identify the top innovators. And then in the whole four-year project, there was an attempt to practically not just introduce uh, raising awareness and help these partners find each other, but also a whole training programme for how to apply for funds, how to be a partner, how to be... Um, collaborate and communicate across that industry academia divide. So these are, I, it sounds like a big advert here, but these are actually three active projects funded by EU where I think our individual or collective responsibility is not just to either participate in them or, or benefit from them, but to really disseminate and amplify, great word, amplify that these exist because there are some really good examples, you know, ongoing or completed that might help address some of the things which some people have been asking for. So thanks. That's, thank you. That's very good, Laura. Thanks very much for that. So three interesting programs there. Are we running out of time? Yes, we are. Listen, thanks very much, everybody, for your questions and uh, your attention. And thank you for the uh, presentations, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.